Hello friends and family, I'm going to gear this video specifically to husbands and wives, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, and other loved ones that are involved in any single mental health journey. Now this isn't going to be specifically towards OCD, I'll cater more towards that, but this is for if you have a loved one who's suffering with PTSD, post-traumatic stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, GAD, generalized anxiety, panic disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, personality-based disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar, the odd case of split personality, um, and all the different subcategories between them. Now, I'm going to gear this video a little bit more towards the anxiety base because that's what we see. But we do have people that come in who have OCD with other things that do have bipolar or schizophrenia in their family, etc. There's a lot of kind of comorbidities and correlations and connections between this and genetic components that we really can't understand. And I'm going to talk about all the mistakes my wife made because she didn't know anything and I didn't know anything either. And then we're going to talk about all the things that are probably the most important for a loved one to understand when they're going through either recovery journey for anyone. So before I go any further, please subscribe, hit that like button down below. Look for that direct WhatsApp link that you can message Phil. Um, I do, I have done many calls with, let's say I have a man that I'm working with, the wife has come on, or I'm working with a girl and the husband or the boyfriend has come on, or same-sex partner, um, just using that for an example. I've had calls with kids with their parents on the phone, especially if they're under the age of 18, and vice versa. So there's many different ways to go about this. Uh, and if you're interested in, we do, or we are going to do more friends and family webinars. I have a, I have a, a garbage truck coming up behind me, so it gets a little bit loud. We will be doing more friends and family webinars because we have a, we always get good responses, but we're going to, we're going to push them more and market them more because there's, as my wife always says, uh, and she is writing a book. She's been writing a book for a while. She has, I think, about 60, 70 pages done coming from the loved one's perspective, which is an incredible way to come from it. And people say that there's no information on mental health in certain countries. Well, there's even less information for friends and families and loved ones. So uh, that's basically the opening intro. And let's jump right into it. So the first thing to remember, and this is primarily for OCD and the anxiety-based ones, and I'll touch on the personality-based ones at the end, the schizophrenia and the bipolar, which we don't, we don't really work with, but we see when they come in, is that they're more than likely not going to get better for a long time. And another thing to remember is when people come into us and they speak to us, and I was the same exact way, individuals will say words such as, I just have this one thing that I have to get better from. Now, if you're married or your kids, or maybe you yourself, it's a mom and a dad and you have OCD, but maybe it never hit as chronically as say your daughter or your son. My father was like this. My father had obsessive compulsive disorder and what I like to call the subclinical level. My grandma, his mom, I think had it above him, but not quite where I had it. It's hard to say because she died when I was 13. But from stories of her contamination, OCD was very, very, very severe. My mom said she always knew something was wrong. I have first cousins who have it. One second cousin, two second cousins. One of my second cousins who I don't really see a whole lot, but his mom, my, my basically I think it's considered my step aunt, um, but I just call her my aunt. She says that her son does is um, suffered very severely um, with addiction and, and, and severe OCD etc. where it's really hindered his life. So there's many different cases of this, but it's important to realize that it's not just one thing. If you have chronic OCD, OCD is everywhere in your life. It's in everything you do. It's in the way you conversate. It's in the way you speak to people in tone, how you ask questions, how you live your life, how your sleep schedule is, how you work out, how you skip work, how you eat, body dysmorphia type fears and counting macros, how you Google and research, how you avoid, it's everywhere. And if it's been around for a long time, 20, 30 years stuck, it's everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And that's okay. That's how it goes. It doesn't matter how long you've been stuck, we can help you. We were, I have many, I have three, three, four people right now and they're 16 above, etc. So super important to look at it from that lens, okay? And the reason why it's so important to highlight that they're not going to get better right away, and it's not just one thing, is patience is key. Now, I recommend 
anyone who's living with a loved one that they read the books on their reading list too, because the books on our reading list were not made for OCD sufferers. They were made for anyone with neurosis or strong black and white beliefs, which everyone has. It's the way the world is, innately, biologically. So those books are really good. I definitely recommend you at least read the first book on the reading list, How to Stubbornly Refuse to Make Yourself Miserable About Anything, Yes, Anything, and then Paul David's book, At Last of Life, the fifth book, because that book will give you inside the mind of an anxiety sufferer who had panic disorder and GAD and kind of how he approached it and what it felt like inside of his mind. So that's a really, really important way to see it, okay? The next thing I want to talk about is that you're not going to be able to do it for them. Now, I have my own opinions and reserves about, um, for an example, and this is directly from, I'm passing this along to you from my friends who have recovered from hard, hard drugs, and this isn't correlated to the video completely, but can give you some context. I have a couple friends who are longtime sobriety friends of mine from childhood, heroin, opioids, alcoholism, who think that rehab facilities aren't the best. Because they say, outside of the overwatch of death from withdrawals and from a friend, I don't know directly, but his, uh, I believe a childhood friend of mine, his fiance's sister, they woke up and she was unfortunately passed away on the bathroom floor from alcoholic withdrawal. Outside of that, when an individual wants to get better and change their life, whatever the reason, they will make that decision themselves. So you can support and guide in the right direction, but you can't do it for them. That is so key to say. And we work with many people who have struggled with addictions, who are struggling with addictions, prostitution, only fans and pornography, crystal meth, heroin, severe marijuana usage, nicotine usage, everything you can imagine I've seen. I can't think of one scenario that I haven't worked with so far. It would be very difficult for me to be surprised. I do get surprised, but it's quite rare. Because when you do this for so long and you do, you know, thousands of calls a year from all over the world, you see everything, every background, every religion, etc. And everyone in their mind, your loved ones, will think they're different. They're going to complain. They might get angry. They might punch holes in the walls, like I did. The behavior is not acceptable, but the human we always forgive. The reason why that compassion for other people is so important is because if we don't hold it like that, it's so easy to become resentful, excuse me, become resentful against our loved ones. And that doesn't do us any good. There's already enough hate in the world, arrogance, vengefulness, rage, and everything else that creates for a very hostile environment. So I know for myself, I try my best to not act like that and change my beliefs, which then influences the people around me, such as my loved ones. That's how I've really fixed many aspects of my relationship is I worked on myself, so loved ones. When you hear that, them working on themselves can really fix your relationship in many ways. It can, it can fix the relationship between me and my mother. Uh, my father's passed away for almost six years now. Uh, me and my wife in many ways, etc. The next thing I wanna cover is do not reward them for doing what's necessary to get better. This goes for moms and dads specifically, but it can be brothers and sisters and husbands and wives. None of, I'll take you to Disney World if you do your exposures. Not a good idea. Why? Because it's not coming from them. And they don't actually want to get better. So, and working with people who are 15, 14, 16, 17, it's difficult because the life experiences, that's not impossible. Every single age group has some sort of difficulty. 70s and 80 year olds, it's the opposite. They've been suffering for 50 years. I got multiple people, again, I've been working with four decades plus being stuck with OCD. Absolutely convinced. I've been living with this for so long. Not going to get better. This is why patience is key. But rewarding them for doing their homework that's required to get better is not a good idea because it's coming from a materialistic external drive to get better. And this is something, a big, big mistake that I made myself, thinking about it in that regard. Um, I'm going to get real personal here because this is something that people will do. Don't do it. Husbands, wives, specifically intimate partners, sex. Do not offer sex as a token for doing your homework. People do this. These are things that no one wants to talk about. Okay. But that's not how I live my life. I talk about the way it is. I try to be a realist. 
a realist and talk about what, what people will do behind closed doors and not speak about for shame and guilt. So uh, we can go upstairs into the bedroom if you, if you do this. It's understandable, but it's not a good tactic to do because they're not actually, again, going to want to get better for themselves. Now, I <laughs> didn't get better for a very, very long time because I didn't want to get better. And why didn't I want to get better? I didn't want to get better because I knew the work required to get better was going to be much more difficult than I wanted to accept in that period of time. Now, I had waves of that. So you will see that, loved ones. You will see these periods where they make progress and then they go backwards and I dig dig digress and go and relapse and we call it backdoor spikes. And the terms don't really matter, but they'll go backwards. They might get angry again. They might yell. So people say, well, what, what do I do in those situations? Well, let's talk about the next thing, okay? What you say to them. This is what we'd recommend. None of this. Don't worry. You can absolutely get better. It's not necessarily true. We don't know if that's true or not. You give yourself a high probability. We stay away from absolutes. What Erica used to say to me when she learned what to say, she would say, you know what to do. I love you and I'm here to support you, but I can't do it for you. And she would just say that on repeat, where I would scream and yell my head off and act very childish, and she, which is an understandable response, but the behavior action itself is childish. And then she would tell me she loves me and she would support me, and that's it. And that's about as strong as it would go. Because with any mental health illness or any addiction cycle, the more you try to do it for the individual, the individual themselves, will never actually get better. It's not never, but it's a high probability that they're not gonna get better uh, because you're putting more effort into their recovery than they are. So supporting them, but you're not doing it for them. Now, moms and dads, this is a slightly different approach because you can sit down with them and read with them. I do work with people in that 14, 15 year old range where there can be a partnership, but there still needs to be a sense of accountability on their part. Husbands, wives, if you're, you know, 20s, 30s, no direct correlation with age, they're gonna have to do the homework themselves. You're not gonna sit down and read with them or anything like that. Again, and, and a 14 year old can sit there and read too, but conceptually the, the, um, the content in the books are, are not easy to understand because they're very philosophical. So we understand that. If you are a 30 year old male or female and you're sitting down and having your husband and wives read to you, you're absolutely engaging in low frustration tolerance behaviors that are not good for your progress. So that is something that you will have to have to cover. So that is probably the best thing that you can say to them. What not to say to them, you're gonna be okay. Um, you're not a bad person. Other people have recovered a lot. Yes, it's true, nothing inherently wrong with that, but if you're saying it over and over again, it instills the idea that they will 100% get better. We don't know about that. It's a chronic illness, more than likely genetic in the brain. It's too specific at the chronic level for it to more than likely just be environmental. But that's a whole other story. If you're interested in that, I've done videos on that in the past. What else? What else do you not want to say to them? You're, in, like I said, you're not a bad person. Uh, trying to reassure them. Uh, oh, oh, come on, you don't have cancer. Oh, come on, you're not a serial killer. Oh, come on, you're not an evil person. None of that. Zero. None of that stuff. It's not good for us. Um, and it's understandable because the natural realm of humanity, because reassurance is a lie. That's what it is in, in proper context. When you are reassuring someone, you are lying to them, which is just, an, it's okay in the fact that this is how society operates, but it doesn't really make any sense. So I'll give you an example, hard example. Five-year-old kid comes to you, you know, this is just a really good way to look at it. Am I going to be okay, mommy? Well, the chances are you don't want to look at them and say, well, statistically, one in four people die of this thing called uh, cardiovascular disease. Really, you know, whether it's a stroke and then a heart attack and then you can get cancer. Then you can get murdered. Uh, you could be sexually assaulted. You can get beat with a bat. You could be decapitated, lit on fire, die in a plane crash, etc. That would be the proper thing to actually say, to set them up for the realities of life while explaining to them that that's how life works and that it's okay to be sad about that. That's more than likely an opportune way to treat someone, but we don't do that because the world views that as abuse or however else they view it. Well, what we say is you can do everything you want, but you can't, I'm five foot seven. Okay, I'm five foot seven. The chance of me being in the NBA and going against LeBron James is very, very low. I've never played golf before. That would probably suck. 
You can't do everything you want. So telling people that everything is going to be okay is simply a lie because it's not true, but we want to make people feel better. But just because you can't reassure them and tell them the unfortunate realities of life doesn't mean there can't be some positive. It's not pure pessimism. And this is where so many people go wrong. They look at that and they say, that is downright sad, depressing. No, it's not. I have completely accepted the realities of life. My life could be ended any, any moment. I have many things in my life right now that I would particularly enjoy having, but I don't have. So at the end of the world, I've accepted that. Natural dosages of sadness and maybe even, uh, even, even a healthy dosage of envy and jealousy. Healthy dosages that could strive me towards discipline and grit and changing my behaviors. But the reality is constant reassurance and coddling to your loved ones does nothing but keep us stuck. And that's a super important thing to remember. So I'm not going to go too much further because I know it's really cold and it's like it's freezing right now. I think it's 32 degrees um, Fahrenheit, which is whatever in Celsius, I think zero. So or something close to that, um, et cetera. So it is important to realize that that type of reassurance is going to work. They have to put the work in themselves. And I said I was going to touch on the schizophrenia bipolar aspects. If you are finding this, there is a high probability that 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 we know of that they will not get fully better from that. That doesn't mean there's not functionality. There are people that live, and there's different levels of schizophrenia, right? And bipolar one, bipolar two, et cetera, et cetera, or different labels of that. And I don't know anything about that, but I know that there's people that operate in society and hold jobs with schizophrenia and bipolar. I know that. That's something I do know. And but but that's an acceptance of a long-term approach. OCD is no different. Some some people may never recover because of for whatever reasons, et cetera. But it's important to realize that. But the very last thing I want to talk about is taking care of yourself. This is something my wife didn't do. She lost a lot of weight because she was so obviously concerned about me when I was in the mental hospital and when the police were called. But she started drinking a little bit more and more wine, which is really common for loved ones to do when their loved ones are going through the recovery process because it's really tough on them. I see this a lot. Maybe you smoke weed and you might be smoking more weed. Maybe you might be disconnecting. So it's important to take care of yourself. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, friends and family members, I'm more than well willing to do sessions with you, me, Rob, Moment, whoever you choose to do it with. If your son, daughter, husband, wife, brother, sister, friend is already working with us, feel free to come to a call. That's a lot of fun, a lot of learning, and then we can go from there. So I hope you guys enjoy. Look for that WhatsApp link down below. Direct message, get you in right away, and then we'll go from there. Have a good one, everyone.